Today's market call is presented by FactSet, financial data and analytics powered by tomorrow. Thursday, April 4th, 1 o'clock. Before we get into it, it's market call, by the way. Um, Dan, Nathan, Guy, Adami. If it's Thursday, bitch, yes. It's butters. It's butters. Last night. Oh, uh, yeah. You got to do it. Line brawl. The Rangers of New York played yeah. against the Devils of New Jersey. Yeah. Now, there's never. Kind of any... arch rivals, if you will. Yeah. I mean, maybe for the Devils. The Rangers have bigger fish to fry. Okay. I mean, as a Ranger fan, I'd loathe the Devils. But there are other teams I probably Correct. dislike more. Anyway. Um. <laughs> There's some bad blood there yeah. this year, stewing from or stemming from a number of different incidents. So it was a foregone conclusion that, you know, Matt Rempe was going to drop with this McDermott character who the Devils had traded for, for that sole reason of, you know, being a bit of an, it doesn't matter because the Devils are going nowhere this year. Correct. In a hurry. But last night, Puck drops, and not only does Rempe drop, but the other four guys Everybody on each drops. team drop i mean this is 1970s shit yeah which is amazing old school old time hockey tremendous yeah i mean keandre miller embarrassed this was kind of john it, marino was guy. Some flap shot stuff is what you're yeah at, old time hockey. i mean what do they call those things what do you people call those things memes yeah things? they call them memes well look at what's going on with ranger hockey because it's ridiculous yeah and yeah. then the rangers who are up to zip gave up three goals wound up winning uh i think they put the devils out of their collective misery yeah. last night so a few devil fans are out there all seven of you as i like to say too bad the mets play a twin bill today um <laughs> at shea not a lot of people are going to show up that's and city the mets field know enough people what that's city field the mets made it a single yeah. admission double header because they know yeah. that if they made it a double nobody's freaking yeah. going yeah the mets suck yankees won yesterday in extras they have an off day. They're in the Bronx tomorrow. So now that we've – oh, and Julius Randle needs season-ending so shoulder surgery. Yeah, sucks. Sorry, Amanda. Uh, let's go right to the rundown because that's – We just aren't... did the Sports Center rundown. We did. The New York Sports. But rundown. here you go. Yeah. S&P threatening new highs. Yeah, sure it is. The banks are buoyant ahead of earnings. And you got some things you're going to take a look at in terms of implied moves and those types yeah, of we're things. Yeah, we're going to hit that. Because we get to the bank earnings next week, guys. Now we talked about the worst looking chart in the markets. You're giving us the best looking chart in the market. And of course, if it's Thursday, it's butter. Yes, it is. Okay. So let's take a look at these certain things. Let's start. Right. Well, let, let's 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 do this here. Cause you know, yesterday we spent a little time guy with the S P. Yeah. And you made a very good point, as you've been making for a couple of weeks, that if the S P were just to kind of go sideways a bit sooner or later, it's going to break that uptrend that's been in place from the October lows. And what's interesting right now is that, you know, there was kind of let's call it some late quarter sort of shenanigans that might have been going on. I don't know, last week. Um, you know, we had a little bit of a sell-off here, but here we are. We're kind of back. We're mm -hmm. threatening those new highs. Looks like a little bit of a consolidation. Listen, you know, yields, we've spent a lot of time talking about yields and the impact that, they, you know, might or might not have on S&P 500 valuations. Doesn't seem to have too much of an impact so far. But as we get closer to earnings season, um, we're going to have a breakout one way or another, breakout or breakdown. It's going to happen here, guy, right? Like there's going to be some sort of narrative that, yeah, correct. Okay. I mean, I think that's your point. And again, yeah. oh, if we don't have the trend line drawn, but you know, you've seen it enough times from us to say that, you know, the sideways action on an uptrend line as steep as that, the time erosion will take you through yep. the uptrend. And that's effectively what's happened now. You haven't seen the move in kind to the downside, but the question is, is it just a matter of time or is it a fake sort of breakdown? You know, you know what I think. I think it's just sort of biding time before we start to break down. We'll see what happens. I guess then the focus is under the hood. What is driving a, a breakout or a breakdown? You know, our friend CQ, that would be. That's Carl Keaton. Yeah, yeah it's that he's the man and he is like the man on the Twitter here. Um, this was from BOFA. That would be the Bank B of America. Yeah, the BOFA. Um, and he's, Didn't Merrill Lynch buy them or somebody? No, no. BOFA bought Merrill Lynch. Oh, BOFA. Rose of the financial crisis that would like be that. in Q4, Q3, Q4 of 2008. You know, you think about it. I mean, I, I'm sure Merrill Lynch was Merrill Lynch. I worked at Merrill Lynch when. when so it's embarrassing that they, you know, but that's a long time. Well, ago. I mean, listen, you know, they made some wrong way bets on the yeah, they did. market guy. Yeah, and, they did. Uh, and they went under anyway, there please and they continue. got saved by the BOFA here. But I, I, Merrill Lynch has been a very well performing unit of uh, BOFA for the last 15 years. Um, so look at this. You know, I know that you're not in the broadening out crowd, if not. you will, but this is an interesting table here. So it's showing that uh, basically year to date where we are in 2024 and it's 
saying basically a year ago. Look at the Mag 7 was like clearly outperforming dramatically. I think obviously you have been all over this oil and gas trade. You've been saying that sooner or later it's going to join the party for a whole host of reasons that a lot of investors did not want to acknowledge. Let's call it six months ago mm -hmm. or whatever. You know, and we don't have to go through all these, but you see what's going on here. So you're seeing some catch up. You're seeing some underperformance of the Mag 7. We said the Mag 7 is now the Fab 4. Who knows? Um, thoughts here, guy, because again, like, oh, like the, you know. year to date, 2024, I see what's going on here. The, those seven stocks are now up 19% as opposed to last year, same time up basically almost 50%. Yeah. Semis are still performing well, but not to the extent of last year. Oil and gas is catching a bid. The home, I, I see what's going on. I mean, yeah, through that lens, you could say it's broadening out, I, I guess, or you could say, I mean, or you could say that the broader market is dragging these things up. The, those seven stocks are basically in line with the broader market. And maybe we have sort of a rounding thing here. Again, you can make these yeah. things look however you want to make them look. I mean, if you want to say that's broadening out, have at it, people. It's the market is still basically getting dragged up by, you know, eight to 10 to 12 different well, stocks. Well, right. And I guess, you know, that first line actually still highlights the point, Guy, that, you know, the S&P is, you know, up nine and a half percent. The NASDAQ is up, you know, eight or so percent, eight and a half percent or something like that. You still have the MAG-7, even with Tesla's horrible performance mm -hmm. and Apple's horrible performance up 19 percent of the year. So they're doubling up the performance of the major indices. The one that sticks out to me, and let's just kind of focus on this for a second here, guy, is financials. OK, so if you look at that, you see 11 percent versus last year. It was down. We know what went on last year at this time. There's still a lot of trepidation about how things were going to basically shake out with a bunch of those big banks, big regional banks going under. Mm -hmm. This chart it's interesting to me and our, our crack team kind of um, put this thing together. So we had yields going up. We had banks going up. That was in the early part of uh, 2023. We had that crisis here. You see what happened. Regional bank stocks got killed. Yields ended up going up. You see that the regional bank stocks, they bottomed out when yields topped mm -hmm. out. OK, and we've seen this inverse relationship. Here we are now, though, guys, we're getting to a point where they're kind of converging back like, in line again. Thoughts here. We're back. So again, if you look at it, it, what it's basically telling you is there'll be a point in time where this correlation, which is effectively one to one, go back, look at the beginning of this chart from May 23 until, I don't know, September or so. Yep. It was basically pretty well correlated. Then something happened. Yields continued to go. The banks broke down. And the same thing, that correlation came back into play as the yields went. Now we're back in line in terms of the correlation, right? Yep. Question is, what's going to give here? Like, I think the 10-year yield's heading higher. I'm one of the few people that think that. And I think what you're going to wind up seeing is that same type of move thanks to the downside. So I think the two are going to meet here. The intersection's going to come over the next month or so. And I think the intersection is going to be yields going higher, KRE going lower. All right, so that's interesting, and, and we're going to. I'm not saying I'm right, but no, that's no, the way I, I mean, look at listen, it. Um, you know, I, I, it's one of the reasons why we drew up the chart. I mean, something's got to give here, and and it's kind of not too different than what we we're just talking about in the S and P 500. But one of the things I wanted to kind of hit on here, guy, because next Friday we're going to have bank earnings, and we already kind of looked at this a little bit through the lens of the XLF um, earlier in the week on Market Call. Um, but we have J.P. Morgan, Citibank, and Wells Fargo next Friday morning. That's April 12th. And one of the things that I found really interesting here is that you know J.P. Morgan. Let's just pull up this chart okay is up nearly 50 percent from its october lows obviously the s p 500 is up less than i think uh 30 percent or so you know they were a huge beneficiary mm -hmm. they bought first republic it was like you know it was one of the easiest dues ever it seems like jamie diamond always puts himself or his bank in the position to kind of pick up some very low-hanging fruit and whenever there's a financial crisis here good on him as you would say guy so Friday morning before the opening, JP Morgan reports the implied move in the options market is about three and a half percent between now. This is Thursday at, you know, what are we, 110 or something like that. And next Friday's close, April 12th here. How do we figure this out? We take the at the money straddle, let's call it the 200 strike straddle, the stocks about 199 right here we put the call premium together we put the with the put premium that gets you about seven and a half dollars you divide it by the strike gets you about three and a half dollars in either direction now if you are looking to obviously buy the at the money call or the at the money put it's half that seven and a half dollars that's how you get the straddle price here thoughts guy on that sort of implied movement seems kind of high for a stock like jp morgan which generally doesn't move much on earning but when you consider how far it's come and what rates might be doing with all this Fed speak and the like here, eh, it seems kind of reasonable. It seems 
listen, it seems expensive to me, but you know, if you're looking at it versus lots of other stocks and stocks that have moved 50% in a matter of what, five or so months, it seems cheap. I, you know, it's funny. I actually think it's cheap in this yeah. environment. Given the run that the stock has had, maybe historically it's expensive. You know, I can't speak to the historical vol of JP Morgan, but what I'll tell you is given the run this stock has had, given how far we are from its 200-day moving average, which historically, you know, we trade around the couple standard deviations away, you know, I would submit that that seems actually pretty interesting to me. And I would say cheap more than expensive. Now, this could come out and report and the stock goes nowhere. And like I might want to do, I'll look dumb. But at this price at 199 given the run, given what's going on, you know, I think this is actually an interesting play. I think Vol works for you in this environment. Yeah, and then this is another point I just want to make. Let's look at the XLF. And again, we've talked about the structure of the XLF with you know Berkshire Hathaway, a large component. Um, it's not a great device as, as far as playing money center banks. But JP Morgan is 10% of that, right? So if you look at the implied move just at the April 12th, 42 straddle, so this, the ETF is trading around 42. It costs you about 70 cents. So again, that's the call premium in the 42 strike in the weeklies, and it's the put premium, put it together, 70 cents. You divide it by that strike, 42. Mm -hmm. You get about one in one point seven percent or so. That is basically half the implied move of the uh, of the J.P. Morgan, which is a a large component. But this is really speaks to the idiosyncratic risk that you have playing a single name. And vol is always going to be higher than in an ETF that disperses a bunch of that sort of risk. I'd back. love to know again historically, and we'll, maybe we'll look at it next week. But historically, what the premium of an ind individual stock like J.P. Morgan is compared to yeah. the XLF. As you mentioned, JP Morgan is 10%. We'll throw up the slide so you can see. Berkshire Hathaway is a little over 13%. Yep. Then you have MasterCard and Visa sort of rounding it out, Bank of America. So, you know, it's interesting. The XLF, as I brought up yesterday, you know, as skewed to Berkshire Hathaway. If you think, if you think Apple is going lower, I mean, this is somewhat convoluted, I know. But if you think Apple continues to go lower, well, Berkshire Hathaway obviously has a huge Apple position. Berkshire has not traded particularly well. Berkshire could get dragged down by Apple, which could drag down the XLF. Yeah, so yeah. that's sort of like third level thinking, it's, it's, but it's pretty, it actually makes sense. It's a really interesting point to make, especially, and it goes to speak to, you know, just, you know, portfolio construction or ETF construction. And you bring it up all the time um, about how some of these mm -hmm. um, are affected by passive investing. So that's a, a good one here. Um, this is a name that we spent some time on. Um, we've been particularly bearish about the fundamentals. Um, the stock has acted in kind. This would be Tesla really quickly. I just want to make this point, guys. So the stock is ripping today on a day where a longtime bull, Adam Jonas from uh, Morgan Stanley, um, he's talking about how the $100 bear case, which I think you and I could kind of get to um, on a whole host of different sort of um, mm -hmm. fundamental metrics, is in play now. And it's kind of funny that the moment that uh, a longtime bull kind of throws in the towel and says, acknowledges, you know, listen, to be very fair, Adam Jonas has had, you know, bull, bear, and base yeah. case scenarios. And he's kind of speaking to his uh, bear case scenario. But you get this sort of reaction here. The delivery numbers were out. Sentiment was really weak into it. Um, the stock sells off after it, and sooner or later, you're going to get a bounce. We said last night, we said it the night before on Fast Money, we've said it on Market Call, not a great press right here before you have a bounce. Well, if you look, yes. And if you look at the moving average, which is now sloping lower for the first time in quite some time, I mean, that speaks to a change in direction, which we're clearly seeing. So you're going to see bounces along the way. It's a question of how much of the bounce is going to happen and how short lived it's going to be. I mean, listen. Look at it today. As you said, we're basically trading at the highs of the day. If this thing starts to reverse later in the day, that's going to be an interesting tell as well. So I get that it bounced. It was probably due for a bounce. You've still been in a significant prolonged bear market yeah. in the stock. Again, the question is how long and how, I guess, aggressive is that bounce going to be? Quite frankly, the bounces have been less and less interesting to me you just did your your uh michael corleone vote i don't know this merrill you just yeah. did that i you really yeah. did and for well, that anyone was, no one know, had michael corleone which, on the bingo card no, today well they should have it every day every day well but, only for one and two but it's obviously i love because the way if you have if, you have, no, 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 if three, soon as i want it out they three, pull no, you back no, no, in no, no, no. i don't even consider that but you know you think about that scene he's sitting with with his sister yeah. who he's not particularly happy not with, happy with right and her sister's then what he learns to be is her fiance yeah who he's not particularly happy with as well. This, but he speaks about him as if he's not in the effing room. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I, I mean, it's you're going to tell him. He's right. sitting right there. Yep. 
I mean, she's got she's had some questionable taste in men at this point. Well, you know she was I mean? lashing out no, at know. her family I, because she knows that Michael had her basically had her husband whacked. Yeah. And then and then she actually forgives him. for Well, visiting. because spoiler alert, though, at the end of the movie for whacking her brother. Well, Ish. look, I mean, I know, I know. Fredo, I know. I, I don't know blood, to tell blood you. guy. I mean, like blood is blood. All right. I just want to go to one. Fredo was weak because this is this is how we got to it. Because and you if said, you go back this balance, in Godfather 2, by the way, <laughs> they show <laughs> you. No, I'm just telling you. If you think about it, there's a scene in Godfather 2 yeah. where they see Fredo being sick. He has pneumonia. Yeah. And all the old Italian women, they had all these as different. As a little baby, you're saying. As a little baby. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, yeah, of course. Yeah. As a little baby. Yeah. And they put a candle on his chest. With it. They're trying to. Yeah. But it, it goes to show that, you know, Fredo was weak from birth. Yes. And and and, and listen. I had a friend. Vito, Vito acknowledged I had a friend that, that I knew. This is a direct. Uh, I don't know how this happens. It's fine. But, we got a few minutes. Um, Not really. But I'll tell you the story. <laughs> Like this guy used to say to me, I want to have three sons. Yeah. Now, this is back in the day, you know, misogyny was a thing, yeah. right? But he says, I'm going to have two chairs at the kitchen table. I'm like, why is that? He goes, because I want them to fight it out oh each night God. to see who can eat. Jeez. I'm like, that's really, that's some Darwinistic that, 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 shit. Yeah. Really quick. Anyway, though, sorry about going that. back to this here, let's look at apologies. Let's go to a multi. Let's see how Tesla. No, no, I want to go to a multi-year chart. So this is interesting. You could say, okay, this looks like a good press. I want to press this stock right here, right now. Let's get it back towards those 52 week lows. What 150 or something like that. I get it. But my point is like, let's see what sort of bounce, because your point that you're making here, guy is the bounces have become weaker and weaker. And when they become weak like that, that's actually when you want to press it. But again, you don't want to press it on the lows you want to see what sort of bounce it has let's, and, that's and why again you want to let's see, see how, it how it closes. let's just see how it closes today yeah but we you know if you want to learn more about tesla oh yeah watch this bang we just had a great oh, we, we had a, we did a great interview ben callo he's been covering tesla that's since it went public i think back in 2010 or something like that it's on gonna drop on the tape podcast danny moses guy dami myself so check that out it'll be in your favorite podcast store but here's one thing you should do rather than going to a store once you're there just subscribe to it and then it comes to your device every day it makes sense you know, to yeah. me all right let's um let's go quickly to we just showed what we think is one of the worst looking charts in the market to one of the best guy and i say this kind of begrudgingly Mr. here softy yeah that would be the microsoft here and when you look at the way that it has held this uptrend like okay, a boss from those <laughs> october lows you look at the way it's consolidated above that uptrend you look at just kind of like it looks like it wants to what party yeah a little bit well here. that's what it looks like yes yeah. absolutely but i'll say this yep yeah. I've said this consistently over the years. I think Microsoft is one of the five, if not three most important companies in the world. Yep. The market cap today suggests exactly that. This is long before it was one of the largest companies. Now, -ish. with that said, I mean, you talk about this stock has gotten itself pretty expensive. I, you know, I haven't looked today, but my sense is, and you have it in front of you, yeah. I bet you it's trading close to 31 times next year's numbers now people say you know what it's justified given the businesses that they're in maybe and the whole ai bend of things but this is not cheap by any stretch of the imagination yeah and i guess I, the, the thing that i would say is and i guess what's happening in the market right now we've seen lots of multiple expansion with generative ai and a lot of folks are basically explaining away steve cohen considered like the michael jordan of of stock trading over mm. the last 30 years was on cnbc for the first time ever people sat down with ars yesterday morning and you know I, I actually started my career working 10 feet from the guy and it's interesting you know i have not seen him in in, in years and years and years and years and probably couldn't put my face up out of the lineup here but it's funny that he sounded almost identical to the way i remember listening to him in 1997 and 1998 a very practical guy did you listen to that interview, no, guy because i have no because, oh, because I'm not he, a, owns the he owns the mets oh my goodness okay there there it is. Well, but it I mean, was interesting. I'm a hater. He said, you know, Andrew asked him, do you think we're in a bubble? Well, I don't think we're in a bubble. It's not like 99. He was seemed very practical and this and that, whatever. But to your point about valuation, Microsoft trades about 36 times right now. This year is expected. Oh, it's this uh, year. This year. Right. And 32 times. I I'm was looking close. at my fact set yeah. machine powered by tomorrow and me. powered by next year's earnings right here. So you are correct. So expected earnings growth this year, about 21% and about 11, 12% next year. So yeah, it's expensive. 
But again, if this is going to be commercializing Gen AI across all their productivity tools, and it's going to be blah, 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 you know, you can make a case how it's going to grow into it. I, I Guy, I get it. I'm just saying from a technical standpoint, and you have guys like him saying, we're not in a bubble. This is why people want to buy these sorts of stories because yeah. that's where you're going to get the outperformance. Totally, right. totally understand. Yep. I mean, and he is a legend. As, listen, respectfully, he is a legend in our world. So when somebody like him speaks, you absolutely have to listen. You don't have to agree, but you have to listen to what he says. So it's a great company. Valuation concerns yeah. me. As good as the Microsoft chart Ooh, looks. I know where you're going. Look at this Nike chart. Oof. Now, to be clear, you know, we've actually had conversations about this for a while. Nike, I think, made its all-time high, like again, many stocks in the fall of 2021. I think the stock was north of $180. You see it now. So let's just say it's been cut in half from its all-time high. We are now approaching the levels that we saw, I want to say, in September of last year, if I'm not mistaken. Do you have it October? I have it September. Well, that was, it was late September. That's when that earnings gap Exactly. Was so there you go. Yeah. Um, this is a big level of support. Now, if we were to sort of broaden this out a little bit, Amanda, and go real here. time, you'll see that the real huge level of support probably comes around, I don't know, 83 or so from the prior September the COVID of 2022. That was no oh, September 2022. Yeah, yeah. Got so it. if you want to even go back longer than that, well, that then the you COVID was you know, down that. to 65. Yeah. I don't think we're getting there. Yeah. So here's the real support level. The question is, you know, do we get there? Or are you trading it here against the September low for a bounce? Or are you waiting for that prior low? That's the rub right now in Nike because they have all kinds of issues working against them. Not the least of which, by the way, comp petition for the first time in a long well time. it's interesting you know go back 10 years guy and we were talking a lot about under armor right that was kind of the thing that was going to bring it to nike and you know under armor has obviously gone the way of the dodo and so right now people are talking about the hoka right and so these are these i have things. hocus do you really yeah do i actually have really? a couple pair you went into a store no and bought hokas i think one of your I children think linda and lily went really because they see what like i wear uh, what am i gonna know and they, they know what size they I like, wear. To me, they look like kind of old people's shoes. I'm old. Like real, oh. Well, they, well yeah, I mean, I, I'm just, I know, I know. But I know. you walk I'm down sorry. the street and people have these things I on. I kind of I don't actually, I don't like them that much. I find that if I, for me, yeah. I have flat. What did again. you run your triathlon in, in in 2000? I think probably Nikes. Yeah. Is my sense. Yeah. I didn't run. I mean, I ran some what of it. You, but... you, ran, you ran, ran a marathon. You completed a marathon. I completed you, it. You, you There's a difference between miles, running it you, and you, completing you it. You biked 114, and then you completed a marathon yes. all under 18 hours. 17 are, hours and 19 minutes. You are an Iron Man. Yes. Can't, can't take that away from you. That's amazing. Okay. So, like, here's the thing. At some point in the next year, some and I remember it, the top, uh, this was the top of Under Armour when they signed Steph Curry and when they signed, I think it was KD, was it KD or something like that? I, I think so. Yeah. And, and so my point is Hoka, the day people, the day Hoka signs some huge pro. Self Sketchers or Deckers or whatever the hell it is. Deckers. And buy Nike. Put that, oh, I like that, that. pair trade on. That's the pair trade. All right. So, so by the way, Deckers has been a So Nike, listen, monster. I, I would love to see Nike continue to get sloppy and buy that into the summer, into the, into the Olympics. That's or the trade. Like that. So that's why I wanted to ask you about that. There is an air pocket from the September two year ago lows to the COVID lows. And listen, Disney got to its COVID lows. You know, like there's a reason. And then let's pull up this loop. Can we hold on a second oh, before yeah, we get the loop? I mean, I mean, I can do this. I know. So overlay a Decker's chart. This is fascinating with a Nike chart okay. if you can. And look at Should the move that, that Decker's has had since, I don't know, the spring of 2022. And look at the correlation with, I think you're going to be. I'm sure a lot of people have seen it. I think you're going to be shocked at the performance of Deckers over this can period I, of time. So can I be, while she's doing that, can I just say this? So, so I'm looking at. Look uh, at that. Ooh, I mean, that. look at that. That is yeah, insane. Okay. Yeah. And we'll, we'll actually. So that speaks to competition, as I was saying. So, anyway. So it's interesting. So, guy, do you think that a Deckers trading at about 33 times this year, 29 times next, expected you know, earnings growth this year. Let, let's just look at fiscal 2025 because that's we're almost there when they report. 11% expected revenue growth um, and on you know, basically yeah. not 11%. That stock's expensive. No, let me tell you, you something. What I mean? the one, when they miss, because the next yeah. stock, you're going to see what happens. Yeah. The first sign of gr growth deceleration, it's over. Now, why do I say that? Remember this chart. Pull up Lululemon and look at what's happened oh, there. there. No, is. but I mean, I see. again, so that's our chart. Look at longer term. Growth, growth, growth. Lower left, upper right, lower left, upper right. Growth stops. Boom. 
stock falls off a cliff. A lot of I just saw somebody with a three hundred dollar price target on Lululemon. So you can see exactly what I'm talking about. You know, it it as long as there's growth trajectory, the stock is fine. When it stops, you see how quickly things change. Anyway, back yeah. to you. Interesting though, you know, this is not a small company anymore. The no. Deckers and and at twenty three. I mean, billion Deckers twenty four billion. Uh, right. Yeah. So like that's kind of interesting. And I'm just pulling up really quickly. Um, Lulu here. Forty billion, I 40, think. Yeah, forty six billion. And again, this company where you know obviously growth decelerated, competition's an issue, but this is trading similar sort of EPS expected growth, double digits, eleven percent this year, twelve percent next guy. Um, trading twenty five and a half times this year, twenty three times next. Sales growth expected to be you know like similar. I mean, like like when I look at this, I say. That's not bad, man. And then gross margins here. Maybe it's a margin story. 58% guy for Lulu and Deckers. Um, all these guys, Nike and all these guys are focused on direct to consumer, higher margin stuff, right? Like that's kind of the trade here. Um, Deckers, you know, 54.5% gross margins or so. I don't know. Interesting. Lots, lots of pairs trades popping themselves up. There's there, going to be a Decker short Nike long pretty quick. Uh, yeah. Before we get to our friend John Butters, yeah. you have to talk about Disney because obviously Disney's been in the news and very quietly, you know, he probably had a 50% move, even even had more from, from that trough low to where we are now in Disney that nobody seems to talk about. We actually started talking about it in terms of, you know, it felt like the earnings trough and the reaction to earnings sort of stopped last fall to the downside. Now, if I'm being honest, I didn't think we'd be $120 stock. You know, I thought we'd get to 110, but here we are now. The question is, can you get a continuation in earnings or is this all news sort of going to put a kibosh on, not kibosh on things, but it's going to sort of slow things down in the near future. That's really what you have so, to look at in terms of Disney. Let's game this out for a second. So you talked about when the stock stopped going down. It's actually when Bob Iger came back in, okay, as a CEO. Ish. Ish, okay, and, and, and so now, now you say to yourself, the headlines are the most costly, you know, battle, like proxy mm -hmm. battle ever. You know, Nelson Peltz is no joke, people. You guys, if you've been in the markets for a long time, he's moved some big, big companies yep. around, bigger than 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 Disney for that matter. Okay. And so the fact that shareholders backed Iger, a lot of really important shareholders, it lets you kind of think that, okay, he cannot like kind of let up here, right? They have to continue on the path in which they set. And a lot of that path is the one that Nelson Peltz was kind of setting out for him. So if they come in and when they report in a month or two or whatever, and they lay an egg and they have the guy down, that's really bad. And so, so my point is they're going to move, they're going to, they're going to push every lever here. So to me, if Maybe. the stock pulls back a little bit, I think you want to buy it. I don't think you want to buy this breakout right here, but if it pulls back, I think it's a clear buy and where could it pull back to guy? That gap, that gap. Now it's interesting because I've thought you could own it into earnings. So I understand what you're saying. I actually think you want to sell it before ahead of earnings because i don't know what they're going to be able to say at this point well all that's going to where it is can, though right well I mean, if it's 120 yes it's exactly right so i thought it would sort of levitate into earnings we'll we see how a it lot plays of time, dude we got more than a month no i know earnings. so so my point is we will continue to revisit this and it'll be interesting to see what we hear from a lot of different investors who came out and decided to vote the way they did all right so guy if it's thursday then if it's, it's Thursday, it's John Butters. John Butters. John Butters is the senior earnings insight analyst over there at FactSet. And he actually graces us with his presence live on the show maybe once a month or so. We take him he more. Physically, if he, no, no. I mean, like he shows up via well, Zoom. And, and we'll take him as much as he wants. That's because, right, because he's in Michigan a lot. Because the work in Massachusetts, the when we're doxing him, the work that he does, Guy and I have been following his work for many, many years. They've been a great partner of ours on uh, Market Call here. But what's interesting to me is sort of the data that he tracks, especially as we got through the end of the quarter. Now we're going to be getting into earnings season um, next week kicked off in earnest by the banks that mm -hmm. we just talked about what john is focused on in this week's earnings insight blog and by the way if you want it in your inbox people on friday mornings you know where to get it we're going to throw a little bit of a slide up here to do that but we preview it on thursdays okay so we're talking about s p 500 or john is negative eps guidance okay and so this is really interesting to me guy 79 s p 500 companies have issued negative eps guidance below analyst estimates yep. for q1 2024 Four, above the five year, which is 58, and the 10 year average of 62. This number ties the mark with Q2 2019 and Q1 2016 for second highest numbers um, of fact set or since fact set began tracking this data since 06. Now, guy, 
Why is this important to me? Q2 2019 and Q1 2016. Q2 2019, we actually, I think we had a 210 earnings uh, or we had a, um, a, a um, inversion of the yield curve. And then 21, uh, 2016 Q1, we also had lots of fears about global growth slowing. And right now we have fears of higher rates, of higher dollar, of higher commodities. So basically what we're saying is, pressures on eps margins or, or, or s p 500 margins think about that. If, if you had asked me okay this is what john's going to do guess what the number's going to be there's no way i would have guessed we were above the five yeah. and the ten year i would have said no way i mean given i would have thought people were surprising so this actually speaks to the fact that something we've talked about you know the earnings are not necessarily going to be as robust i think as people have in their models that's just my opinion so 2019 and 2016 remember I think it was in the middle of 16 or so we started talking about currency problems with China, I believe, yep. if I'm not mistaken. So, and it's it's mirroring what we're seeing now in terms of what we're seeing with but, Japan. Anyway, but guy, but 19 and 16, go back. We actually, had rising rates. So the Fed was raising in 16. They were coming off ZERP that they started doing in 15, and then 19 we were raising interest rates. And in both instances, they had to come. Well, and it speaks to the the weight that higher rates put on yes. right earnings and earnings estimates, and obviously at a certain point margins as well. So if you're in the camp, like I am, that rates are gonna to continue to go higher, I don't think it augurs particularly well. And I guess to your point, that backs it up exactly with John's work. Yeah, so like if we get into earnings season and we start seeing companies guiding lower for Q2, I mean, that is gonna be clearly a sign that we've kind of hit peak margins and some of the things that we've been talking about on the inflationary front, whether it's rates, whether it's dollar, those are starting to impact S&P 500 earnings. All right, let's look at a couple other sectors here though, guys. So the technology sector, 25, healthcare 14, and industrials 12 um, have the most companies issuing negative EPS guidance so those are the those are the components, okay, mm -hmm. of those negative guides. The industrials plus six and technology plus five sectors have seen the largest increase in negative EPS guidance versus their five year averages. Technology, I mean, it's it's incredible. Again, I wouldn't have guessed this. Healthcare, maybe it makes sense. I can't say for sure that you know what we've seen from some of the managed care like Humana and at, uh, excuse me, UNH and yeah. those if that's in there, but. That's interesting as well. But technology sticks out like a sore thumb here, as it typically does for good or for bad. And that will be the sector, like you and I have been on uh, you know, agreement on this, that will lead the broad market lower because of the concentration of those names in the index, but also the concentration of their earnings um, you know, contribution to the index. So again, you better hope that we don't see more Teslas, that we don't see more Apples of the mega cap techs, because no matter what those other sectors, whether they're guiding up or down, it's not going to matter because they just don't make up a proper way. So listen, if you want John Butter's work in your inbox, you know where to go. Go to FactSet. There it is, insight.factset.com slash subscribe, and you'll have it delivered to what, your inbox. What's today? It's Thursday. Well, what date? Oh, it's the 4th, 4th. of April. Yeah. I mean, we're going to be month. down there with these cats oh, fact set, at the, the end of the month. conference. It's going to be in Miami. 29th, and I believe. And listen, if you still haven't signed up and you're- no, I think they set, sold it. I think it's sold out. It probably is sold out, but we're going to have a bang up. You and I are going to be doing a session, a market call session live from the main stage. Tuesday. Yep, yeah, on Tuesday. I think it's the and 31st of April. Maybe you, I got to go look. Yeah. I mean, I don't have. And then fun. we're going to be doing some morning market sure. wraps. We're going to be we're there. Be doing another market call. It's going to be a lot of fun. And we have it. They invited us to a dinner. Yeah, we got lots of stuff. We're going to be all over the place. So, so um, get all get all up in there. Trade ideas. Where can you find them? Where our oh, trade hey, ideas? Listen, go to riskversal.com. You're going to have it in your inbox. You're going to have the show notes. You're going to have the charts. You're going to have the trade ideas. All to your inbox. Please sign up there. Obviously, Guy and I are also focused on what we are looking at on the Instagram. Our crack team puts out an Insta post each morning. Guy is Guy Adami. We are also at Risk Reversal Media. I'm Dan's S. Nathan, and we're doing a little bit of a preview of what we're focused on that shortly after the opening, and we will hit those topics in the market call. So go follow Kyle, us. We got a lot going on. As we mentioned, we talked to Ben Callow. It was Danny Moses. It was Dan Nathan. It was great. yours truly. Yep. Talk to Ben Callow. That will drop in your favorite podcast store right, tomorrow, the On The Tape Podcast. All right, let's do it. We're out of here. We, we did this thing on the screws. It was a lot of fun here, guy. Uh, Mets play two today. I can only hope they drop them both because an 0-6 Mets squad into the weekend would just be, yeah, be happy so there. beautiful. All right. Wouldn't it be? Yeah. No. That's I'm a hater. Somebody said to me the other day, you really should get like therapy. Like, what's your problem? Yeah. I, I don't know the answer to that.
Uh, you're, not, you're dialed out well, already. No. I mean, listen, I can tell. I, we did what we were here to do. If you guys want more of that, you can go to the Sports Center. I mean, we're trying to help Bob Iger monetize his ESPN there, maybe a little bit. We just talked about the Disney here. Um, yeah, enjoy. We got fun. Five- <laughs>